How the Lykovs lived all the years of hermitage is now not so difficult to say, especially for those who know the local conditions well. The Lykovs, like all peasants who have lived on individual farms for centuries, perfectly mastered all types of peasant business. They knew how to do everything that was required for a normal life. But in the conditions in which they found themselves, any work required ingenuity, ingenuity and great effort. And some of the work had to be abandoned altogether. A very limited number of gardening and any other tools, a limited number of utensils for cooking. Several cast iron pans, pans. Cups, bowls, spoons, all made of wood. All containers for storing food supplies for the winter, twos, boxes of various sizes, were made of birch bark. By the way, this is the best container for storage, and this container is used to this day throughout Siberia. There was absolutely no iron, nails, bolts, screws, staples, etc. The absence of all this did not allow doing much that even in their conditions would have been easy and simple to make. Here I mean carpentry, carpentry and any other work that could significantly improve their life. Clothing and shoes were a serious problem. Everything that was brought from the world in Taiga conditions quickly fell into disrepair. There was one opportunity to make clothes ourselves. They only had hemp at their disposal. This large annual bast fiber plant, when properly cared for and processed, produced fairly strong fiber. They managed to preserve and maintain in working order a loom, which in Siberia was called krosna. It was not difficult to make a cross with an instrument. During the war, Krasna could be seen in many peasant huts. In our village, as far as I remember, there were three or even four such machines. It was with his help that the Lykovs weaved the simplest canvas of hemp threads, the only fabric from which they sewed clothes, bags and made cords and ropes. I must say that the whole process, from sewing, harvesting to obtaining threads and, finally, fabric is long and very laborious. The thread spinning was especially tedious. Shoes were also very difficult. There was practically none of it. It could have always been in the required quantity, but the Lykovs did not have livestock, therefore, there was no main raw material, leather. The first 10 to 15 years of hermitage, Likov had a small supply of rifle cartridges, and Molokov left either 10 or 15 cartridges back in 1941, when they met. This allowed Likov to hunt for merrells, in any case, when we came to the Lykovs on Erinat in 1947, when we examined the estate, we found the remains of worn-out Ichigas of various sizes. All shoes were made of merrill leather. According to my assumptions, at the beginning of the 50s, there was already nothing to hunt for merrills, except for trapping pits, but to catch up and prick in the ice in winter. And this did not happen often. As for the manufacture of leather, Likov mastered this craft perfectly. All the necessary components for leather processing are available in the Taiga in unlimited quantities. During the war years, leather was also made in our village. Kazanin and Brilyakov, whom I have repeatedly mentioned, were especially great masters. I remember when a bear lifted up a cow near the village itself, Kazanin made the skin, and I came and looked. And even then he theoretically comprehended this science. When the skin was dressed and wiped off, we spread it out, and I counted all the wounds inflicted by the bear's clawed paws. And Parfenty Filimonovich, pointing his finger at the slots, told me, in sequential order, how the bear beat and tore the cow with its claws until it knocked it down. But the main thing is nutrition. The Lykovs had two sources of food at their disposal, a vegetable garden where potatoes, turnips, onions, peas, a little rye were grown, and another source, taiga. The main attention was paid to the garden, and thanks to the timely planting, weeding, hilling, it was a reliable support for the family. The trouble is that the Lykovs lived too high in the mountains. At this height, the summer is noticeably shorter, therefore, the vegetative period of plant development is shorter. And not all garden crops, mainly root crops, could grow in such harsh conditions. Therefore, there was no need to miss a single day during planting, grooming and cleaning. It was very difficult to fit into this framework. Therefore, at one time Karpasipovich decided to build a house on the bank of the river, which is much lower in level above the place where they lived. Here they founded another vegetable garden, in which everything grew much better. 
In addition, someone had to be closer to the water in order to catch fish, one of the main food products obtained from the wild. There were other reasons to split up, but these are the internal affairs of their family, so I will not touch on this topic. The Lykovs caught fish quite a lot, all year round, with the exception of spring floods and sharp water rises during summer rains. But most of all they caught it during its spring and autumn migrations. We fished in winter as well. While visiting the Lykovs on Aranat, we noticed the tasks made of solid cedar boards, such as a shallow trough, about 1.5 meters long and 40 centimeters wide, about 3 centimeters thick. Clean planed, very light, they glide perfectly in the snow. They were a kind of sledges. Dusts were covered with fish scales, which confirmed the catch of fish in winter. The caught fish was dried and dried in the summer. They collected mushrooms, berries and also dried them, there could be no other type of canning at their disposal. Nutrition and preparation of food for future use were a constant concern. And another main gift of nature is pine nuts. I have already spoken quite a lot about pine nuts, but it must be added that pine nuts are an unusually nutritious product. High calorie, very tasty, with a pleasant aroma and high oil content up to 60-65%. Cedar nut oil is the most environmentally friendly vegetable oil. Cedar grows without human intervention, while any other oil plant is grown using various kinds of fertilizers. Cedar bears abundant fruit once every three to four years. Dried nuts are stored in barns and storage sheds for three to four years. Thus, this most important food product could always be in a well-organized collection and storage, but this is not always possible. The weather intervenes, rains, early snowfalls disrupt all plans. But the main thing that was missing in the diet was the complete absence of salt. And it was excruciating. Taking a step back, I would like to tell you that once, while working on an expedition in the Western Cyan Mountains, Molokov and I accidentally stumbled upon a small barn on one of the Tega Lakes. It stood about 150 meters from the shore, overgrown with young trees all around. When we entered the barn, I noticed that on the floor near the wall there were three or four, I don't remember now, logs about 1.5 meters long, about 50 centimeters in diameter. This surprised me, and I asked Molokov why they had brought these bricks. Molokov smiled and said, look in the right way, these are decks. Such decks were made simply. A slab was chopped off at the log, with the help of an adze, the middle was hollowed out in it with walls within 5 centimeters, depending on the purpose. Then the slab was put in place, and the deck looked like a log again. I went over and lifted the croaker, and we saw that they were all filled with rock salt. From the place of residence of the Lykovs, if you count in a straight line, to this lake about 60 kilometers. Did Likov know about this? If he knew, he could use it, and for some time they would not be in poverty. In almost all their affairs, the Lykovs experienced difficulties and hardships, and if they got used to a lot, somehow adapted, then it was very difficult to get used to the lack of salt. True, a reservation must be made here. Only the elder Lykovs had to get used to hardships and difficulties. They were born and raised in the normal conditions of peasant life. They ate and dressed, like all peasants of average prosperity. They knew what bread, cereals, various vegetables, livestock, which gave milk, meat, skins, wool, poultry, etc. were at hand. Any family had all the necessary tools and equipment at hand. And here there was none of this. This was precisely the tragedy for adults. It was painful and difficult for them. It was something for them to get out of the habit and to get used to. All four of their children, two sons and two daughters, with the exception of the eldest Savin, not only did not know anything of this, but also did not represent much, and Savin could remember and know little too. Therefore, they had nothing to get out of the habit. And what they lived by was taken for granted, they knew nothing else. In this environment they were born and raised. And if any questions arose based on the stories of the parents, the head of the family would say, We cannot do this, and it was introduced into everyday life as a law, as a commandment. Under the ban, the Lykovs also had a bath. I am personally surprised why Lykov refused to wash in the bath and deprived the whole family of it. 
since ancient times, you will not find in any scriptures that washing and taking a steam bath is a sin. The elders like us perfectly knew and understood the extraordinary benefits of washing, and especially the boys, and they used the bath before leaving for the desserts, like all Russian people. And they steamed with birch brooms. Birch has been a constant companion of man since ancient times. It is a versatile medicinal tree plant. We all know that for the treatment of various ailments they take from birch, buds, bark, leaves, growths on the trunk, the so-called chaga, an excellent birch sap. The Lykovs knew this very well, and they used all of this when there was a need, but for some reason the bathhouse with birch brooms did not come to the court. The Russian bath was and remains one of the most useful. The bath heals, heals and, as they said half-jokingly, half-seriously, wash away sins. People of my age, who lived in Siberian villages, know and remember well that until the end of the 40s there were still baths in black. In such baths, stoves were without pipes, so-called heaters. Those who did not have metal containers, they heated water in wooden tubs, throwing hot stones into it before washing, and the water immediately boiled. Everything else is the same as in all country baths, a wide bench and a traditional shelf on which they steamed. So to build such a bathhouse, even in such conditions, in which the Lykovs found themselves, would not be difficult. No hardware required. Perhaps the circumstance played a big role here that it took time to heat the bathhouse, and one could easily find oneself in large clouds of smoke. I remember, when we were looking for the Lykovs, we watched for a long time to see if there was smoke going anywhere. Malakov then said that the Lykovs were stoking the stove in the hut for sure at night. The first 10 to 15 years they were especially hidden, and perhaps, for this reason, the absence of a bath gradually became normal. In fact, in all old believer families, wherever they lived, there was no such indiscriminate prohibition on almost everything related to the world. The old believers used almost everything that was done by human hands. They, like all peasants, freely sold their agricultural products and bought clothes and equipment for the needs of the family. True, this does not mean that nothing was prohibited. There were many things under the ban. First of all, smoking was forbidden, it was a great sin. The old believers explained this wise prohibition simply, the teeth rot and fall out of the tobacco, the soul goes out of the mouth, the insides rot, and they die before living a century. And so it is. Here is a short, but capacious description of one of the main evils that a person voluntarily uses to harm himself, without thinking about the consequences. Before the split, Russians did not smoke at all. Under the ban was the use of alcoholic beverages, or, as they said, bizarre wine. They consumed only honey beer, mead, and only on holidays and special occasions. This is the oldest Russian drink. They were very careful with the dishes, did not give them to anyone, they used them only with their families. We never shook hands with anyone, but in fairness, it should be said that even before the split they acted correctly in this regard. In ancient times, when such terrible infectious diseases as plague, cholera, smallpox and other misfortunes raged in Russia, people during the period of pestilence avoided each other, avoided any contact, and there could be no question of a handshake. They themselves explained. Any disease will jump from hand to hand and clung to. In addition to the fact that the old believers did not smoke, did not drink wine, they never shaved, explaining this, God gave a beard. The old people said that the beard was for health. It is curious to note that everyone who wears a beard almost never gets sore throat and other diseases associated with the upper respiratory tract, rarely anyone gets sick and teeth fall out. While in the taiga somewhere outside the home, they never drank cold water. On agricultural work, they always had a canteen with kivasa water at room temperature with them. In winter, being even for a long time on the street, they did not drink water, and if somewhere in the taiga in winter there was thirst, then they would scoop some water from a spring or river with their palm and, holding it for a little, they would drink directly from the palm. As I already wrote, Karpasipovich was born and raised in the mountain taiga of the Western Cyan Mountains and lived all his life either in small villages or in the settlements. Ekulina Karpona was born in Altai on the Baya River, in a relatively large family settlement of more than 20 households, and as if on the high road. 
but there and there the same customs and orders were preserved, which came to them from their grandfathers and great-grandfathers. And they were all the keepers of this culture. Their children became the same guardians. It must be said that throughout Siberia at all times the peasants, whether they were old believers or secular ones, all observed almost the same religious holidays, celebrated certain significant dates. In all the villages and villages of Siberia, the inhabitants were equally happy. They organized various games, among which the most popular were small towns, grandmothers, rounders, shishik and others. These games were played not only by young people, but also by elderly people. In addition, in summer and autumn, on certain days, young people gathered outside the outskirts, where songs and dances sometimes lasted until the morning. They organized all kinds of competitions in strength and dexterity. They especially loved horse racing. In a word, Russian culture perfectly combined work, rest and entertainment. In essence, the keepers of the old faith, and therefore culture, were people in all strata and classes of society, from the peasants to the statesmen. They did not hide their religious beliefs and outlook on life. All of them were distinguished by their efficiency, enterprise, resourcefulness and, like all Russian people, were happy for Russia. But the arrival of Soviet power, collectivization, repressions destroyed the established foundations for centuries, and people, by virtue of their capabilities, began to adapt to a new life. As I already wrote, those who did not agree with the new order began to change their places of residence, and some again, as before the abolition of serfdom, went into the Tega wilderness and sank into oblivion. Someone later could not stand it and left the Tega, someone managed to go abroad, someone disappeared without a trace. Despite the terrible difficulties and incredible hardships, the Lykovs survived. Finding themselves in complete isolation from the world, having almost nothing of even the simplest equipment, having neither livestock nor poultry, using only what the garden and Tega provide, they survived thanks to life experience, ingenuity and constant work. For many years of complete separation from people, they did not make a mistake a single day in dates, not only in years, but in months and days. No entries, all in memory. The Lycos chronology was not dated from the Nativity of Christ, but, as they explain, from Adam's summer, that is, from the creation of the world. The head of the family, Karpasipovich, kept all aspects of their family life under control throughout the entire period of Hermitage. Knowing the local conditions perfectly, he passed on the experience of learning about nature to his children, supervising all household chores. Thanks to his constant control, the family survived until the arrival of almost complete people. Everything was done in the family only with the consent and direction of the head of the family, and what he said was law for the family. It must be said that in all old believer families, authoritarian orders persisted, and questioning obedience to the head of the family. Akulina Karpana taught a lot, who ran the household and, along with her husband, did all the hard work. In addition, the children learned to read and write. And in such conditions, where there was no paper or pencils, where there was no normal lighting in the evening, except for a torch, the like of children learned to read and write. The textbooks were church books of ancient Slavic writing. Akulina Karpana taught literacy, as Agafya told me. Thanks to Mama, they were honored to read and write. Please share this video on your social networks, using the buttons under the video and subscribe to the channel. I ask you to go and watch other videos about Agafya Lykova, which you can see now on the screen in the end screen savers. There are a lot of rare and interesting facts about the Hermit. Thank you all for watching.